Uh, it is my favorite bit to read aloud. Uh, you know, here in this book, uh, uh, young people in San Francisco uh, discovered that there's a worse thing that, still than having your city bombed by the uh, uh, by terrorists, and that's having your city occupied by police force who decide to take away your liberty in the name of keeping you from being bombed by terrorists in the future. The terrorist bombing ends. The police occupation never ends unless you uh, take back your freedom. Um, and they, they uh, uh, decide to do exactly that using technology, math, and civic engagement. Um, now, the, uh, the main character in this book is a kid named Marcus. Uh, Marcus is the founder of something called the XNet. Uh, the XNet is a uh, network of hacked Xboxes that have been cryptographically secured so they can communicate without being wiretapped. And uh, Marcus uh, was just at a party, a key signing party, uh, where they exchanged secret keys so they could keep their privacy in the future and, and maintain uh, in, uh, institutional secrecy, uh, where he met a young woman who was asked him out on a, on, on a date to an illegal concert, an illegal open-air concert in Mission Dolores Park in San Francisco that was organized with the, um, with the, uh, under the auspices of the XNet. And uh, before they go to the concert, they're going to have a burrito and that's where the action opens. <laughs> Mission burritos are an institution. They are cheap, giant, and delicious. Imagine a tube the size of a bazooka shell filled with spicy grilled meat, guacamole, salsa, tomatoes, refried beans, rice, onions, and cilantro. It has the same relationship to Taco Bell that a Lamborghini has to a Hot Wheels car. There are about 200 Mission Burrito joints. They're all heroically ugly, with uncomfortable seats and minimal decor, faded Mexican tourist office posters, and electrified frame Jesus and Mary holograms, and loud mariachi music. The thing that distinguishes them mostly is what kind of exotic meat they fill the burritos with. The really authentic places have brains and tongue, which I never order, but it's nice to know they're there. The place we went to had brains and tongue, which we didn't order, but it was nice, but, sorry, which we didn't order. I got carne asada and she got shredded chicken, and we both got big cups of horchata. As soon as we sat down, she unrolled her burrito and took a little bottle out of her purse. It was a little stainless steel aerosol canister that looked for all the world like a pepper spray self-defense unit. She aimed it at her burrito's exposed guts and misted them with a fine, oily red spray. I caught a whiff, of, a whiff of it and my throat closed and my eyes watered. The hell are you doing to that poor defenseless burrito? She gave me a wicked smile. I'm a spicy food addict, she said. This is capsaicin oil in a mister. <laughs> capsaicin? Yeah, the stuff in pepper spray. This is like pepper spray, but slightly more dilute and way more delicious. You can think of it as spicy Cajun visine, if that helps. <laughs> My eyes burned just thinking of it. You're kidding, I said. You are so not going to eat that? Her eyebrows shot up. That sounds like a challenge, son. You just watch me. She rolled the burrito back up again as carefully as a stoner rolling up a joint, tucking the ends in and rewrapping it in tinfoil. She peeled off one end and brought it up to her mouth, poised with it just before her lips. Right up to the time she bit into it, I couldn't believe that she was going to do it. I mean, that was basically an anti-personnel weapon she just <laughs> wanted on her <laughs> She bit into it, chewed, swallowed, gave every impression of having a delicious meal. Want a bite, she said. <laughs> yeah, I said, hey, I like spicy food. I always order the chili, the curries with four chilies next to them when we get it from the Pakistani place. I peeled back more foil and took a big bite. Big mistake. <laughs> you know that feeling you get when you take a big bite of horseradish or wasabi or whatever and it feels like your sinuses are closing at the same time as your windpipe, filling your head with trapped nuclear hot air that tries to batter its way out through your watering eyes and nostrils? That feeling like steam is about to pour out of your ears like a cartoon character? This was a lot worse. <laughs> this was like putting your hand on a hot stove, only it's not your hand, it's the entire inside of your head and your esophagus all the way down to your stomach. My entire body sprang out in a sweat and I choked and choked. Wordlessly she passed me my horchata and I managed to get the straw in my mouth and suck hard on it, gulping down half of it in one go. So there's a scale, the Scoville scale, that we chili fanciers use to talk about how spicy a pepper is. Pure capsaicin is about 15 million Scoville. Tabasco is about 2,500. Pepper spray is a healthy 3 million. This stuff is a puny 300 grand, about as hot as a mild scotch bonnet pepper. I worked up to it in about a year. Some of the real hardcore can get up to a half million or so. That's 20 times hotter than Tabasco. Pretty freaking hot. At Scoville temperatures like that, your brain gets totally awash in endorphins. It's a better body stone than hash and it's good for you. <laughs> I was getting my sinuses back now, able to breathe without gasping. Of course, 
you do get a ferocious ring of fire when you go to the john. She nodded, <laughs> giving me a wink. Youch. You are insane, I said. Fine talk from a man whose hobby is building and smashing laptops. That was part of that key signing party. Touche, I said, and touched my forehead. Want some? She held out her mister. Pass, I said, quickly enough that we both laughed. When we left the restaurant and headed for Dolores Park, she put her arm around my waist, and I found that she was just the right height for me to put my arm around her shoulders. That was new. I'd never been a tall guy, and the girls I dated had always been my height or taller. Teenage girls grow faster than guys, which is a cruel trick of nature, so this was nice. It felt nice. We turned the corner on 20th Street and walked up to Dolores. Before we'd taken a single step, I could feel the buzz. It was like the hum of a million bees. There were lots of people streaming toward the park, and when I looked there, I saw that it was about a hundred times more crowded than it had been when I went to meet Ange. The sight made my blood run hot. It was a beautiful, cool night, and we were about to party, really party, party like there was no tomorrow, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Without saying anything, we both broke into a trot. There were lots of cops with tense faces, but what the hell were they going to do? There were a lot of people in the park. I'm not so good at counting crowds. The papers later quoted the organizers saying there were 20,000 people. The cops said 5,000. Maybe that means there were 12,500. Whatever, it was more people than I ever stood among as part of an unscheduled, unsanctioned, illegal event. We were among them in an instant. I can't swear to it, but I don't think there was anyone over 25 in that press of bodies. Everyone was smiling. Some young kids were there, 10 or 12, and that made me feel better. No one would do anything too stupid with kids that little in the crowd. No one wants to see little kids get hurt. This was just going to be a glorious spring night of celebration. This, I figured the thing to do was push in toward the tennis court. We threaded our way through the crowd, and to stay together, we took each other's hands. Only staying together didn't require us to intertwine fingers. That was strictly for pleasure. It was very pleasurable. The bands were all inside the tennis courts with their guitars and mixers and keyboards and even a drum kit. Later on XNet, I found a flicker stream of them smuggling all this stuff in, piece by piece, in gym bags and under their coats. Along with it all were huge speakers, the kind you see in automotive supply places, and among them, a stack of car batteries. I laughed. Genius! That was how they were going to power their stack. From where I stood, I could see that they were sold from a hybrid car, a Prius. Someone had gutted an ecomobile to power the night's entertainment. The batteries continued outside the courts, stacked up against the fence, tethered to the main stack by wires threaded through the chain link. I counted 200 batteries. Christ, those things weighed a ton too. There's no way they organized this without email and wikis and mailing lists, and there's no way people this smart would have done that on the public internet. This had all taken place on the Xnet. I bet my boots on it. We just kind of bounced around in the crowd for a while as the band tuned up and conferred with one another. I saw Trudy do from a distance uh, in a tennis court. She looked like she was in a cage, like a pro wrestler. She was wearing a torn white beater and her hair was a long, fluorescent pink dread down to her waist. She was wearing army camouflage pants and giant gothy boots with, boots with steel overtoes. As I watched, she picked up a heavy motorcycle jacket as worn as a catcher's mitt and put it on like it was armor. It probably was armor, I realized. I tried to wave to her to impress Ange, I guess, but she didn't see me and she, I kind of looked like a spaz, so I stopped. <laughs> the energy in the crowd was amazing. You hear people talk about vibes and energy for big groups of people, but until you've experienced it, you probably think it's just a figure of speech. It's not. It's the smiles, infectious and big as watermelons on every face, everyone bopping a little to an unheard rhythm, shoulders rocking, rolling walks, jokes and laughs, the tone of every voice tight and excited like a fire.